you turn the heat off at home. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of busy night tonight. Um, I'll start off with the IA news sheet. Has everybody got their news sheet? John's got a few at the back there. Thanks again to Chris and John and also Neil for putting the news sheet together. I think it's still a bit of work on the back there. Um, and we weren't going to do it coming off the sky through Paul, just for a wee bit of change. But Paul is still in, in Ben Arm. One of the benefits of living in Ben Arm is I think the snow is a wee bit heavier. So about five minutes before I left the house, Paul called me and said, Look, can you do it? Because I haven't got it. And I said, Okay. Um, we'll have a wee bit of an update quickly on observing. As you know, anybody who's at the last meeting, um, Delamont is no longer available to us. Is David here tonight? He's not. Okay. Um, so that left us a bit of a quandary. So what we're going to do is do observing from Tiny Boy. And we're going to do observing tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, at the observatory down to Tiny Boy. And if anybody doesn't know where it is, come and talk to me afterwards, and we'll give you directions. But you're very welcome. And we now have the IAA 16 inch telescope down there. So if you haven't seen through a big telescope, you now's your chance. And it's going to be quite nice tomorrow night. The moon's not, not going to interfere, so that'll be good. The other thing we have is Terry's teacher as usual, and of course the main speaker tonight is Ernst, good friend of society, and I'll introduce him properly in a second. So now we're in the ball stuff, and I haven't seen this, so I'm flying blind here. But um, as we usually say, the sun is very active, very, very active at the moment. And there's a monster right coming up to the centre of the disc at the moment. And um, this big fella here, AR3190, uh, about four or five times the size of the Earth and make an eye sunspot. And at this point, we always say, don't look at the sun with your naked eye, don't look at the sun with a telescope, don't look at the sun with any form of optical medium because you're going blind. But if you've got, say, a pair of eclipse glasses, you should be able to see this sunspot. It's a real monster. Um, at the minute, he's active, he's throwing out lots of stuff, and we're really hoping that he's going to produce something nice. Um, again, just on the right-hand side, you can see the sunspot count, uh, and you can see, look, if you look down the list, you can see around about 2014 and uh, 2015, we're back to there. So um, the, the current cycle is moving forward at pace, which is probably good news. It's going to be more active than perhaps we originally anticipated. And uh, just a couple of nights ago, there was a reasonably strong aurora. We were sort of clouded out pretty much. I haven't seen any local photographs. But this was a very nice one that Paul has picked up on space weather, I think. And you know the, the idea is that the you know the plasma comes from the sun, it hits the earth, a magnetic field, it rattles down through the poles, and we get the polar auroras and the nice auroras. So we're hoping for a really good display. The moon, um, the moon is identified there on the 18th. It, it, it won't come up until pretty late, so it'll stay dark for a good while. And you can see in a couple of days' time, it's going to be new moon. So, anybody that was out last night, did anybody go out last night and breathe the freezing cold? It was really nice sky last night, it was gorgeous. One of the best winter skies we've had this year. It's really, really nice, but it was bitterly cold. Okay, the planets are still pretty active and uh, sort of straining a wee bit. Oh, let's see this. Did anybody see Venus go in? I come up from behind her. Well done. I come up and bang her and was able to watch it for about halfway up and then the clouds came around. And right beside Venus there was um, up on two, slightly to the left hand side was Saturn. Couldn't see Saturn, but it's there. And again, if you wait until the sun sets, you get your binoculars out probably. Don't really need binoculars for Saturn, but once the sun set, you'll see Saturn and Venus pretty close together over the next couple of nights. Still on the planets, um, Mars is pretty much Still dominate the sky of Jupiter, two brilliant, brilliant bright planets. Jupiter, pretty much over in the west at the moment, so still there, still looks good through the telescope. And uh, Mars, almost overhead up in Taurus, it's moving a wee bit. You might remember at the last meeting I talked about it starting to move in the other direction. And um, for the last month or so, it's been building in between the horns of the moon, and now it's moving up past the, uh, the Pleiades. So Mars is still very easy to spot. And in between them, somewhere in there, can't quite see it, the computer, but I know Uranus is in the middle. Uh, it's in Aries. I can see it from here. But, oops, there it is there. Then press the button down here, because you know we, uh, we 
passing that way. Where is it? There it is. Yeah, it's, it's still sitting there. So Uranus is still there. It's not visible to my naked eye. Some people to me that they can they can see Uranus with their naked eye. The ISS is doing a series of evening passes, which again is fantastic. It's very, very bright. Can't remember whether it's the second or third brightest object in the sky, um, apart from Venus, but it's very, very bright and unmistakable. And you can see from the list, even heading up towards the end of the month, the start of February, there's going to be some nice high, high passes and some very, very brilliant passes. So the ISS, so it's worth having a look out and then we wave to them. And of course, the buzz at the moment is the comet, comet uh, E3 ZMTF. That stands for the Swinky Transient Facility, uh, strange name. Uh, and that comment has been creating a wee bit of a, a buzz on the internet. It's very faint, it's very, very faint. And anybody who read Terry's last email gets a proper picture for what the comment will probably turn into. Now it's very, very hard to predict what a comment's going to do, but you can see this one is very nicely placed. So if you've never seen a comment, or you want to, you want to see a comment through your binoculars or even the telescope over the next week or so, that finder chart says the 16th to the 23rd, and um, it's going to be visible quite easily in, 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 the, uh, in the evening sky, not too far away from the cloud. And by the 23rd, there it'll be reasonably high up. The cloud the is still quite low down in the early evening, so by about the 23rd, you'll be able to see it very easily. Um, as I say, probably not going to be brilliant, probably not going to have much of a tail, despite. The, uh, all the beautiful images on the uh, on the internet. Okay, um, the object observing we've more or less mentioned. We're going to do it at Candy Boy rather than, than uh, Donald. And uh, the next item is Terry. Terry's teacher. Right, folks. The good news is that when they try to think of a teacher, the many directional planet atmospheres, I couldn't come up with anything that I could have even answered myself. So I've just given a, uh, come up with a, a very general one. You all know about the constellations, there are 88 of them. Uh, few of them have uh, double word names like Ursa Major, Chemist um, Benetisi, and so on. But of the ones that have just a single word name, which constellation name is the longest? Camelo Pardalis. What? Camelo Pardalis. Camelo Pardalis. We don't get him in the ladies, I don't know the answer to that, correct? Right, what's the second longest? Sagittarius? Aragonus? No. We'll be here all night. Microscopium, which is a giant in the, uh, the southern hemisphere. We get to your choice of a large barn or a, or a, or a BYA, where we are just the, uh, the big C.
that is the way Mercer Telescope, the 4.2 meter telescope on La Palma, and it's observing the night sky. Uh, so this is actually taken during the night with full moon, and if you study exoplanets, you go to the darkest place in the world to observe them in detail, and you end up with skies that are just, well, not quite blue if you look at the day time, but if you try to take some astrophotography, you get AC blue skies. Um, one bonus question, can anyone spot the constellation and or planet? That thing here? It is Leo. Can anyone spot the planet? This is a tricky one. Uh, you don't identify the particular planet because I haven't specified here, but it's actually here. Uh, there's Mars over here. So, so I'm going to be talking to you about search for, exo for molecules in the atmosphere from exoplanets. So I've talked in the past a lot about how we can find planets. I'll go over briefly as we might because it's important to understand what we are actually finding and what we're doing to try and observe these planets. But then I want to go a little bit more in how we study the atmospheres and show some recent results and where we're heading uh, as a field. And although I show some results from JWST as well, I'll focus mainly on what we can do from the ground in general, just because we have some exciting telescopes in the near future, like the extremely large telescope, which will be help, really helpful for our research. And so by the end of today, I want to sort of convince you that we are now at a place in time where we can start to make inference of exoplanet atmospheres and learn something about detailed compositions, like we're able to do with our solar system. So this is a picture of the transit of Venus in 2004. And you can see very faintly the atmosphere uh, around this planet. And using my highly skilled uh, artist uh, skills, right, we um, want to convince you can try to do these things with exoplanets as well, to try and learn what they're made of. And also, hopefully, get some insight on how they formed. Because we can study their composition. We can learn what materials went into making it, and that can tell us something where they ultimately formed. So how do we find exoplanets? Well, the easiest way, at least intuitively, if you just think about it, just point the telescope at the star and see if something moves around it. But if you look at our solar system as an example, we find a big problem. So what I have here on the left is the relative brightness compared to the sun. So this is how bright the planet would be if it was a image next to the sun. So if you're looking from far away, how bright these planets our solar system would be. At the top, the planets are 100 million times fainter than the sun. At the bottom here, that's 100 billion times fainter. So planets are very, very faint. And if you look at it, our best shot may be Jupiter, which is, at least in visible way of things, a bit over 100 million times fainter than the Sun. But that's extremely dim. And then the stars are very far away, so the planets, I mean, from our perspective, the orbits are very large, right? But if you look at it over a large distance, these, pla these planets will just be extremely close to a star, very, very hard to separate. So we like it to try to spot a firefly next to a lighthouse. And I should actually make this picture correct. Right, so, well, try to spot this firefly here. I did make sure it doesn't scale to 0%, it's technically still there, but it will be extremely hard to spot. We succeeded in a very few very special cases. And in this case, we don't look with our telescope with the negative. I'm actually looking at the infrared, where we look at the heat from these planets. And especially look at the planets that have recently formed, because when they form, they sort of condense out of gas and dust, and that releases a lot of energy. So these planets are actually literally glowing. They're actually literally red hot glow. So these planets may be 1,000 degrees or hotter even. And that means that in the infrared, they're relatively bright. And if you then look at nearby stars using specific instruments, we can just about pick them up. 
So just these are two examples. We know of a few more. This system is called HR8799, and we have uh, four known patents in the system, B, C, D, and E. This system I really like, although uh, it's also really annoying. It's called Beta Pictoris. It has a plan that's been directly imaged. And I'll just rotate it here because he actually been observing it for quite a long time. And you can see this planet, this planet move. And if you extrapolate, you can see it gets very close to its star. And one thing I like is planets that move in front of the star, and it looks initially like it would do it. Unfortunately, it didn't. Um, but that did mean I get close to spend 100 nights on VOT time observing it. So there's some fun there. So we need to be smart about finding these planets. And one of the main ways people started to do this is known as the stellar wobble. So what we're looking for is basically the planet pulling on the star as it goes around. So we always say, oh, the Earth is orbiting the sun. But actually the Earth is pulling on the sun, so the sun also moves a little bit as well. The movement is very, very small, but it does move. So what we can do is we can look for this motion. So this is an exaggerated animation. You have the planet going around. The star is going around to a much smaller orbit because it's much more massive than the planet. But as it does so, we can try and spot this uh, movement. Of course, we don't have nice circles on the sky to find them. And typically, we also don't see the planet, so we just see this star wobble. And if we look from top down, like we do in this animation, we can use the, uh, instruments like the Gaia satellite to spot this tiny motion of stars on the plane of the sky. But in many cases, this motion is too small to detect on the plane of the sky, but you have to use another technique. Well, as this star is moving around, it's actually, especially tilt to orbit, so it's coming towards and away from us, it's moving towards us, away from us very periodically. But this movement is tiny. So this is the location of the center of the sun due to the planets compared to basically to what we know is the very center, the uh, center point of the solar system, where everything is orbiting around. And you can see that the sun moves around, right? It looks like it's probably going to be quite a sizable thing. Well, this is the sun's to scale. So to detect the sun moving, right, we need to measure something that's moving by maybe the diameter of the sun over a time scale of tens of years, so that's quite hard. But we can use something else. I already mentioned the star maybe moving away from us and towards us, and if we use a fundamental property of material that they want to, every atom and molecule emits light at very, very specific wavelengths, of course. And so here are two spectra, at the top is hydrogen, it's quite boring. If you get a spectra, actually like a one like a ear or a spectroscope, you can just look through with visible uh, lights. So what your eyes can see, there's only four lights you can really see. Iron, on the other hand, has tons of lights. So this is just a very simple spectrum, and there's lots more lights that are a bit fainter that you could also have. But because we know these wavelengths exactly, we can try to observe them in the star. Of course, stars are made up of a lot more than just iron and hydrogen, so the spectra are a bit more complicated. And also, we don't see these lines as bright emission lines, but rather we see them in an absorption. So this actually is a spectrum of our sun, or technically a spectrum of a cloud that's reflecting sunlight because that's typically the best you can do with Belf in Belfast. And what you see here is basically a fingerprint from lots of different atoms in the solar atmosphere. So this one here is called hydrogen beta. So it's hydrogen uh, in the atmosphere. This here is magnesium. Uh, I don't quite have sodium in here. But a lot of these lights are lights from aluminium, calcium, iron, and other elements. So not only does this tell us a bit about the composition of the sun, it also gives us a nice reference where we can check how much these lights are shifted. Of course, if we try to measure it uh, like this, 
it needs a very high resolution to find the movement, right? This, this is sort of a very low resolution, so we need a much better spectra after I can build in a box like this. But in principle, if you just look at these lines, over time and the star is orbiting because there's a planet around it, or possibly another star, or even a black hole, you would see these lines go back and forth with time. It will be very periodic, right? It will keep going. Um, but there is one problem. If we look for planets, they're kind of low mass. Jupiter is a thousand times lighter than the Sun. So the velocity that the Sun will be going at will be quite low. The Sun's velocity due to the Earth is 0.4 kilometers per hour, or 10 centimeters uh, per second, so basically about this speed. Right? I'm pretty moving my arm faster, the Sun is moving due to the Earth. The Sun's velocity due to Jupiter is about 40 kilometers per hour. And a little bit slower than you drive in the city, as long as you can drive and don't have to wait for a lot of traffic lights. So, if you go back to that animation before with the lines, and we have the stationary spectrum at the top, and the standard spectrum at the bottom, this is what you see. I should be pretty can't see anything, right? That is because those lines will move by less than, uh, what is it, one part in uh, a billion or something like that for the Earth. Nevertheless, people have persisted, so these are actually the first people to discover planets around the sun like stars, so this is Michel Mayor and D.J. Villot, and they used the spectrograph on uh, a telescope at Observatoire en Provence to look at a star called Fifth One Pegasi. They are trying to find planets and they are thinking they could find something like our solar system, so they are planning to take data over decades to basically find something like Jupiter, but what they found is this object here. So they saw that fifth on Pegasus, the star, is moving back and forth. So you can see it moving away from us, moving towards us, moving away from us, etc., etc. If you look at the speeds, actually this is quite fast. This star was moving at about 60 meters per second, which is pretty the approach speed for a typical jet that is trying to get. Right? So it's actually 200 kilometers per second, 200, or so around, or 200 kilometers per hour, roughly. And what's more interesting, if you look at the solar system, Jupiter takes uh, more than a decade to go around. They found that this object was doing that every 4.2 days. So they found this planet that's orbiting a star at 4.2 days, and is roughly half the mass of Jupiter, when you work out uh, the mass. And because of that, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in physics for the discovery of the first planet around the sun-like star. And this opened up, basically, the field of exoplanets. Because for the first time, we had evidence of a planet around another star. It was not something we expected, because in short period, it's roasting there. The day side can be about 1,500 degrees or so. So it will not be a very comfortable place to live. But nevertheless, it's a planet around the other star. And here at Queens, we're now continuing with the search of planets, and we're a member of the Harp 3 at the IMT, uh, which is called the Terra Hunting Experiment. And we use, they're basically we're modernizing this telescope and building uh, a spectrum called Harps. And I think uh, Chris Watson talked about this uh, a while ago uh, to you. And uh, hopefully, our aim is to find planets that are more like the Earth, right? Fewer of masses in periods of maybe up to a year. There is one problem with the state of velocity method. Because we are measuring what the velocity of the star as it comes towards us and moves away from us. If the star is in the left case, and the Indonesia at the start is moving basically just on the plane of the sky. It's never coming towards us, never moving away from us. And the velocity of the star is just flat. We'll basically say, oh, there doesn't appear to be a planet there. In most cases, it will be somewhere here in this case where the orbit is tilted. So we see part of the velocity of the star coming away, uh, towards and away from us. 
But the issue is that if we do that, we don't quite know the true velocity, right? We only know how much to move away towards away from us, and that means we only have a lower mass. So that can be difficult if you want to study the plant in detail. But there is one more case, and that's actually quite nice, is when the orbit is exactly aligned with uh, the viewing angle of Earth. So basically, it's just whizzing around in and out of the planet sky, because then we actually have another phenomenon that will help us greatly. And that is that when the star, uh, when the planet passes in front of the star, the light from the star gets blocked slightly, and we get something that's known as a transit. And this is great because A, we know what orientation the orbit is, so we know it's, we can measure its true mass, but also we can determine the size of the planet. So what I have here, if it works, I've had some issues with this occasion, is basically a view of what a standard system would look up close up, and I'm measuring how the brightness here of the system, and why is it not starting? Okay. Oh, right, I know why. Sorry, I moved to Mac to be, because it's easy to carry around, but the movie doesn't work. So let's do it in a different way then. What we see is the star here, and we have a planet blocking light. And the amount of light blocked here by the planet will cause it to the star to appear dimmer when the planet is in front of it. And this light is directly proportional to what fraction of the star is being blocked by the planet. So, if you're trying to find a planet, say, the size of Jupiter, do you think this is about the right scale compared to if the star is the sun? See people shake their heads. Does everyone shake their heads? Well, yeah, this is way too big. So, do you think this is more to scale? Still too big or too small? Too big. Well, actually, this is what Jupiter would look like if you get it in front of the sun. So if you move out to the outer solar system, you could see Jupiter transit. It would look something like this. It would block about 1% of the surface of the sun. But what about the Earth? The Earth is still smaller. Well, this is what the Earth would look like if you try to measure a transit. It's there. Might be hard to see from the back, but it covers less than a percent of a percent of the sun. So if you try to measure that, that will be extremely challenging. And one of the reasons it's challenging is that you need very, very stable measurements. And that's hard to do. So people have been looking for transit. So uh, at Queens, we're a part of this instrument here on the left, which is called SuperWasp. And it basically is camera lenses that observe a large amount of stars in the sky at the same time. So I think these are 200 millimeter lenses, uh, just Canon lenses. And they put cameras behind it, professional grade cameras, and they just take pictures of the sky and they go, go back and they try to search for these dips. There's a project on our light called Hat, uh, for HatNet. And they all basically look at large patches of the sky for these tiny dips. The problem is if you do it from the ground, the Earth's atmosphere is in the way. So this is actually real data that I've taken with the Isaac Newton telescope of two stars. They, let me show you. Star A and star B. One star has a planet that's actually transiting at this time. So there's a slight dip in flux. The other star is just basically stable. But if you're observing through the Earth's atmosphere, and if you point closer to the horizon, you could have seen if you ever look through a telescope that uh, air is more unstable, but also things look a little bit dimmer, look a little bit redder. And as you go, you observe a target, you go towards almost uh, zenith, so high up, it actually is, it appears a little bit brighter, and that's because the atmosphere of the Earth absorbs light. So can anyone tell me, and again, some people have seen this before, tell me where or which of these two stars has planet? Is it the star on the left or the star on the right? I see some people point. 
So I see someone point to the left. Yeah, you can actually just about see, if you're very carefully comparing, you can just about see that there's a slight dip here. And what we do is we actually use this other star as a reference. We basically say, okay, this is stable. It just does get some sort in the Earth's atmosphere, but everything else is stable. So we just divide the two out. And now you can clearly see this very nice transit that's about two and a half percent deep. But of course, this is nice for giant planets because this is two and a half percent. If you try to do the Earth, that would be about the width of one of those black lines that you need to find. So you never see it with a telescope on the ground in this way. So there's several space missions, just to show a few examples. Here's some Kepler. Uh, you probably have heard of the Kepler mission, it's been observing, was observing for continuously for four years in field near Cygnus. There's TESS, the Transit Action Planet Survey Satellite, that's actually still observing the sky and still finding many new planets. And there's a European mission called KEOPS, which basically targeting planets are the stars where you think we have a planet and try to get more details um, to study them. Now, what these, what these telescopes have revealed is that our solar system, in terms of the number of planets, right, more than one planet is not unique. So, this is the Kepler Order 3. So, this was, I think, about six years ago, seven years ago. Uh, all the planets that Kepler had discovered that were in multi planet systems, where there's more than one planet in the system, and on top of that, you can barely see the solar system. So, most of these planet systems are very, very different from our own, right? We have here, on our solar system, we have the rocky planets, all close to the sun, and the gas and ice giants far out. Well, the planets that Kepler has been finding in multi planet systems have gas giants close into their star. So the giant Jupiter like planets are scrapped in their stars, often inside the orbit of Mercury, and you made four or five planets there. And uh, I pretty much tell this too long before you get hypnotized and fall asleep. Um, but yeah, it's sort of a very strange uh, system we find. And we try to learn a bit, want to learn a bit more about how we form. And one way that can tell us about the formation is looking for the atmosphere. So how do we find an atmosphere? Well, in the solar system it's actually easy. Right? I showed you this image at the start of Venus during transit, uh, during its transit, and you can just observe it. Of course, again, this is in front of the sun, use proper protection, right? Don't look at it directly. We can go <coughs> to space, right? For further, we have definitely an evidence that there's an atmosphere here, we're leaving it. But from space, again, you can see this thin blue sliver of an atmosphere around our planet. We have probes that landed to Mars. They've taken pictures of sunsets. Um, there's pictures of weather or <coughs> Mars, for instance, as well, with dust levels and everything else. There's clouds that move, time lapses of that. But again, with space probe, we can send there. For exoplanets, we can't do that. They're just too far away. So, how can we study their atmosphere? Well, if we're lucky and we, have, we can directly observe them, so this again at HR8799 that uh, image planet systems, you can get your instrument and take a spectrum, so separate the light out, uh, directly of this planet. So this example uh, by Conor Pecky et al. From this, from this planet, and you can see, well, it's hard to see actually, but you can see there's water here, there's methane, there's carbon monoxide, and you can directly detect these gases. If you take an instrument that can measure much more precisely, you can actually measure the rotation of your exoplanet. So typically you think of a planet, we just look at it with our eyes, we just see an image, right? But actually if we, if a planet is rotating, the star is rotating, we can actually measure the velocity of each part of this planet. So if we turn on our Doppler glasses to look at this velocity, we see that the side that's going towards us, the light will be slightly blue shifted, so it will be basically 
moving towards us. But the other side here, so the other side is moving away from us, it means it's redshifted. So just like we have a, a star that's coming towards us, which would be like the side to blue shift, then moving away from us, start to redshift it. Different parts of the surface of the planets are coming towards us or moving away from us. And then if light is emitted there in a specific uh, line from an atom or molecule, you see this pink, right? That's blue shifted from where you expect it to be in the middle of the planet. There's, there's no movement, right? It's just moving perpendicular. It looks like it's stationary. And if you go to the other side, it's red shifted. And if you add everything up, you see that it actually is much, much broader than the individual peaks here from the individual small savers. And so if you can measure how broad these lines are, we can measure how fast they're rotating. So Stan et al. in 2014, uh, observed beta pictoris B uh, with uh, a spectrograph, uh, actually looking at carbon monoxide. And what they found is that if you, what you expect from the planet that wasn't rotating would look like this. But what they found was actually that it's much, much broader. It's very obvious that it's broader. And from that, they could, they could measure how fast it's spinning around its axis. It's spinning around its axis with a velocity on the equator of 25 kilometers per second. Right? So that's many, many factors uh, faster than, uh, for instance, Earth, which is just a few hundred meters per second. And interestingly, if you know how fast it's being around, it's actually, you know, an large mission can work out today, and its day is only a few hours long. So, well, its orbit is probably about 20 years, so you have to wait a long time before you get curved. There's many days in between. I just want to highlight that James Webb's Space Telescope will actually ch help change this field because it's looking outside of the Earth's atmosphere, it is much more stable, it can actually do, uh, should do an amazing job identifying many more molecules and giving us much more insight in what's going on. But as I said, my aim is to focus mainly on telescopes on the ground, and especially the transit planets, which are the ones we still know the most about. So how do we go if we can't directly separate the light from the star and planet? Well, we can look at the light passing through the atmosphere. I showed you that picture for Venus, where there's a sliver of light going through the Venetian atmosphere, we can try to do the same with exoplanets. So this is just a schematic. We have the star here in the middle. We have the planet going around its orbit. And then during the transit, that is passing in front of the star, part of the light of the star will go through the atmosphere and gets absorbed. And we can try to look for the signature. Right? So we're trying to look and light from the star passing through the atmosphere as the planet is in front of the star. And I want to do a short demonstration if this works. I'm going to sort of swap over to the HDMI. Okay, that seems to actually work. Get this started. So what I have here is a spectrograph. So actually I should show you here. If you want to take a look after the talk, I'm happy to open it up after the talk. I don't do it before because that messes up the wavelength calibration, it doesn't work as well. But what we have is basically, this red thing here is going to simulate, for the star, there's an LED light here, that will simulate the star, and there's a telescope here on the right, and this telescope will uh, funnel the light into an optical fiber, this orange thing here, that goes there into the side of the spectrum. And inside the spectrograph, there are several Oops. There we go, turn on the star. Uh, optical components, so the light comes in here, and then it gets focused on the grating. So I don't know if anyone has looked at a CD and you look from the side to see the rainbow colors. Well, the grating has a similar effect, and it then gets detected by a camera uh, on the side. So I showed this back of the sun before, so this was taken with the spectrograph. A few years ago. 
So let's see if this works. This will take a while because we actually do all the steps we do with a real spectra. So we can do a lot of some calibrations. The only thing it doesn't do is recalibrate the wavelengths. I've done that separately. But what I'm going to do is show you what happens when light passes through filters. So actually, I have a set of filters here, and I'll start with the very cheap uh, acrylic ones, and then we'll have a short quiz with some more advanced ones. But basically. I have filters here from basically blue all the way to red. And I don't know how well you can see it, but basically you can see that this is a red filter. It always takes a few seconds to get this going. Okay, there it is. So this does look very exciting. So this is spectrum of the uh, lamp that I have, and it's completely flat. You see some wiggles and they're just noise. So let's see what happens if I take my blue filter and put it here in the light path. It takes a second to update because it actually took a reduction. And what you see is that a lot of the light has disappeared, right? It was here up at one, a lot of the light has disappeared. I should actually explain this is wavelength here on the x axis. And I think I may have blocked it because it looks slightly off at the moment given where the blue filter is. But you see that the blue filter lets light through at shorter, bluer wavelengths. Right? So the light gets blocked and bluer wavelength, and that's why the blue filter gives you a blue color. It blocks all the other light, but that's blue through. So let's take a look if I take a green filter now and place it in the light path. We'll take then a second to update. And now you can see that the green filter doesn't let us move much short wavelength light through. And per here, it cuts off. Uh, at some point, I need to get a new CCD so I can get the full spectrum. Um, but basically, you see it goes down here towards redder wavelengths. And that's what gives you the green light that you can see through the filters. I can keep going. I can go to yellow now. Right, so the yellow. Again, it will take a second to update. Well, basically, it's, these are very cheap filters, right? I think I bought this for one dollar on sale in Canada. Um, so you can see that basically it lets uh, uh, through quite a lot of light here at 580 nanometers, close to the orange sodium lines. Um, and so these are actually quite poor filters. And if I go on and I pick my orange filter, put that in. You can see that this starts to basically block all those lights that in the past we had seen, but it doesn't, it starts to let through towards the orange light. And then if I pick my red one, can you guess what happens when I put a red filter in front of here? Anyone? Moves to the right. Well, it actually moves to the right so far that it will stay as a flat line. So, as I said, I need a broader spectral range between CD and CC at some point. So, of course, these are very cheap filters. Let's go one step up to the ZWO RGB filters. And these are much harder to show what color they are if you hold them up because they're just reflecting light partially. So let's put one of those in. So, can anyone guess what color this would be? <coughs> well, it's pretty good. Yeah, this is red. This is the red filter. Put in another one. This is the blue filter. And you can also see that this is a much nicer, nicer filter, right? So the other ones were very much like, uh, well, they went up a bit and they went down again, so very smooth curve. 
the total maybe at 25%. This one that's almost, well, about 90% is light through. So these are actually something you want to use in your telescope because of that much more light through than the other ones I had before. I'll do one more from these, this series. And let's see if you can guess what color this is. Green? Yes, this is a green filter. And then, of course, just for, since I have them anyway here, I want to show you two different filters that uh, one is pretty something you may want to use if you do astrophotography. The other um, is actually something that might be nice for solar but I haven't actually got a chance to try it yet. So let's put this one in first. Can anyone guess what this would be? This is actually what's known as a light pollution filter. So they've designed the filter to block out the region here we have sodium and a lot of the mercury gas, and that through light right here we have uh, oxygen and things like hydrogen, which are really nice for capturing nebula and all those cases. Uh, things. The other specialty filter is actually more used in the daytime, and like this. So this is actually what's known as a narrow band filter, and this one is designed to observe the sort of things we want to look at the granulation of the sun and things to produce one of these. The interesting trick I can do is I can actually rotate this filter, and what you see is that the wavelength shifts. And people have used filters like this by turning them. Actually, your if anyone has a uh, HL for telescope, it works by basically effectively turning the filter or changing the path between them, and this filter is a good example uh, of that, where you can see that happening. If you tilt the filter, the wavelength shifts towards bluer uh, wavelengths. And so you could actually tune this if you want to, to specific regions. So why do I want to show you this? Well, when we're looking, uh, let me just stop this. When we look at an exoplanet atmosphere, what we're trying to do is, of course, detect what gets absorbed. But that means that when the light passes through, we effectively see as color. So this is more a schematic of an exoplanet. So we have the star here on the left, the Earth here on the right. And in the right panel, I show you the light curve that we measure. So basically, how the light varies with time. So the planet starts to move onto the star here, it gets dimmer, and then it blows the star, and it gets back up again. And if you look at the wavelength, where the atmosphere is transparent, for instance, that's the extreme, you have a planet that's basically an orange filter, and you look at orange light, we measure the size of the planet that corresponds to between these two lines, and that means that we block about, in this example, just over 1% almost one half percent. But if you now look at a different wavelength, say you can look at a planet made of orange uh, acrylic, not very realistic I know, but we look at blue wavelengths. At these wavelengths, the atmosphere, right, or the acrylic will absorb the light, not let it through, and so the planet appears much larger, right? So here it drops down to almost two percent, or just over two percent. And so if you can measure this at different wavelengths, measure the size of the planet by measuring how deep this transit is, we can learn something about the composition. Of course, this is very exaggerated, these scales here. These are some realistic models of a hot Jupiter and, an Earth, and something that looks like the Earth, basically would be identical to the Earth. And we know that this planet has a radius of about well, just under 100,000 kilometers, and these variations here are less than 1,000 kilometers. So we're looking at tiny changes, right? About a percent of the planet's radius. So that's going to be tough. For the Earth, well, we know it's just over 6,300 kilometers radius. <coughs> if we look at oxygen, oh, that's, that's, that's the first planet. Um, we look at oxygen. 
we see that that oxygen extends up by about 80, 90 kilometers, right? So it actually, compared to the oxygen, it's just over a percent. And oxygen is one of the strongest absorbers. If you talk to any astronomer and a look spectroscopy in the optical, they will always complain about oxygen absorption because it usually gets in the way of interesting uh, lines and it's very hard to deal with. But even that is a percent of radiation. Remember, I told you before that the Earth looks less than a percent of a percent. The Earth's atmosphere, or the changes in the Earth's atmosphere, are a percent of that. So that will be very, very hard to measure. But if you take observations of these whole Jupiters, where it's again a percent of a percent, you can actually do that. So, it can learn something about this atmosphere. So this is data from Singedal, who pointed to Hubble Space Telescope at AC Mali-9733b, and he got exquisite data. Remember that light curve I showed before where the two stars were next to each other, and then I showed the transit there? This is the same planet, so you can see how much better it is to do it from space. You may wonder what this bump is. That's actually a spot on the star that the planet just happened to uh, go off. So we know the sun is now active, we see no sunspots. If you observe from afar and you see a planet, one of our solar system planets broke that sunspot, you would see a peak like that in the transit. But if you do that again at different wavelengths, you see a spectrum where you measure radio. So basically here, you have the size of the planet, as a function of the wave. So blue is here on the left, red is here on the right. And what we see is that it's actually very featureless. There doesn't appear to be much going on, except it goes smoothly up towards bluer wavelengths. Well, where have you seen that before? If you look at Earth, we see a blue sky. And why do we see it? Because the atmosphere scatters blue light uh, towards us. So during sunset, we see a red sunset because the blue light just gets scattered away uh, from us in the sun. And basically, only the red light is left over. Well, this, this planet we have something similar. It's a gas giant at about 1200 degrees, so I wouldn't recommend going to a beach there. Maybe a bit of hot. But you would see basically a red orange sunset if you would be able to do it. But another planet actually has looks very different. See? So here on the left, we have the same sort of measurement of the size of the planet as a function of its wavelength for AG 209458 e And now, very catchy name, um, but you get used to it. And what you see is that, yes, it does have this blue where it gets a bit more scattery, but it also has this orange light being absorbed. And this is from sodium in the atmosphere. So, this planet actually has a little sodium in its atmosphere that's absorbing light. And so the sunset would actually look completely different. It would look actually bluish. Blue light would get better through the atmosphere than the red orange light. So these are interesting things we can learn about this. And if you take something like James Webb, we can not just look for the overall sort of what would be the sunset color, we can actually measure the composition. So this is data from James Webb Space Telescope that was recently published by the uh, early science community. And here again you can see the exquisite light curves that it gets. So you get very, very high precision. You can really measure very precisely the size of the planet. And if you do that, you get this measurement. So again, this is size of the planet, measures the transept, so what fraction of the stars blows as a function of wavelength. We're looking now in the infrared, so we wouldn't be able to see this with our naked eyes. We need special instruments. But the interesting thing is, here is this bump here that you see, this very, very large bump. And that bump is due to carbon uh, dioxide in this planet's atmosphere. So we now know that most pretty line has carbon dioxide, so that means it definitely has a lot of carbon, it definitely has a lot of oxygen, and we can study that and learn a bit more about its composition. Actually, we can see a little strange something else. So there must be probably some water, uh, maybe uh, some what is it, H2S, hydrogen sulfide. And if you want to get a good measurement of water, this is an example for another planet. 
Slightly different wavelength, again from James Webb. Again, very precise measurements. And you see these wiggles here. These wiggles are all absorption by water. And so we definitely know that this planet has quite a lot of water in its atmosphere. And if you can measure water, you can measure carbon uh, dioxide or carbon monoxide, you can start to learn what went into forming this planet and how it will strain uh, what we do. Learn about it, how it formed and how it will strain our models that we use to learn more about these uh, So evolution. You can go a step further. If you get a better spectrum of that can look at much finer details, we can actually use the fact that the planet is orbiting around the star to try and look for the motion of the planet. So if you look at the Earth and the Sun, the Sun, I told you, was moving at about 0.4 kilometers per hour, you could pretty cool quicker than the Sun is moving. But the Earth is going around its orbit at about 30 kilometers per second, so much, much faster. And that means that the Earth, if you would observe it over time, we actually have quite a large radio velocity difference. The same thing goes for ultron Jupiters. The stars are moving a bit faster, maybe 100 meters per second, uh, the speed of a light aircraft, but the planet can be moving at 200 kilometers per second. So that's a lot faster. And that means that actually during a very short orbit, we see the planet move back and forth by 200 kilometers per second, or double that, 400 kilometers per second in total, and we can look for that signature. So this is just a simple model where the planet is moving in front of the star and in this case we showed that it had an atmosphere that contained a lot of water. In that case, you see that at the start it's moving at about 70 or 80 kilometers per second towards us and at the end it would move at about 70 or 80 kilometers per second away from us. The interesting thing is and if we try to look at the real data, so I said this was a model, this is the real data, we don't see anything. What does this tell us? Well, this tells us there is no water on this planet in a large quantity. With big asterisk, because if you have clouds, or you make your atmosphere basically 100% water, the signal will get a lot weaker, and you can't quite build it. You can do more interesting things. This is actually quite a complicated diagram. So basically before we had the streak here, right, this is the planet. We now have a streak that we observe in the planet was 76 b And it actually is interesting. So this white line here is what we predicted that the planet would be moving at. So this will be Yellow Nine 2020. Uh, they're looking at iron. So this is an atmosphere of a planet that has gaseous iron. So this planet has a temperature of about 3,000 degrees. Again, not a very comfortable place. But you can see that the prediction here is right line, that the yellow part is a little bit off from that. So what we did, what they did, is they basically tried to imagine you're in the orbit of the planet, and then look at what's happening. So what we did is we just straight, what they did is just straightened this out, so the planet should go vertical here along this white line. But what they found is that it's slightly blue shifted. It's about five kilometers per second blue shifted, but even more. At the start, it seems to be closer to the uh, white line than at the end. So we see some change as well. But this shift here is actually indicative that this planet might have a very strong wind blowing from the day side to the night side. So we can learn something about the climate of these planets from these kind of observations. And I just want to show that we are not just looking for iron on this planet, people have been looking uh, for water here, iron cyanide, and also ammonium, although the latter is not detected. So it's interesting that we can see different compositions and again measure these. And we're currently trying to get better methods to really determine how much water there is, rather than just detecting there is water.
So this is the second way you can study the atmospheres. It's called the secondary eclipse. And this is basically after orbitating your planet, as past and from the star is continuing on its orbit, well, after our data needs to pass behind the star. That's called the secondary tips. And I just want to put that briefly because my research on exoplanets started with looking for the secondary eclipses. And this is just a highlight. So, what you're now seeing is the planet disappearing behind the star and then coming back out again. And so, this tiny difference here which is about 0.2% for this particular planet, is based in life from the planet that's been blown by the star, in this case. So we can measure that, and we can work out its temperature to be over 3,000 degrees for this particular object. We can look at secondary tips and we can observe them multiple times. So this was done by Matthew Houghton here uh, at Queens, who's now, if you see it, I can't remember his name. He's not in Dublin. Oh no, he's in Cambridge, I think. Uh, but he observed two, two eclipses of a planet, and he saw that in one case, the eclipse is much deeper than in the other case. That's strange. What could this be? Well, we're looking at effectively very old gas in the planet that's emitting a lot of light, and if you cool it down a bit, it gets a bit dimmer. So this may be evidence of storms that are sort of brightening and darkening the planet. And I currently have a PhD student uh, called uh, Niall Owens, who's trying to extend this by not just observing two eclipses, because that would just be some weird data, but observing tens of eclipses for this planet and trying to confirm if this is real weather or maybe something that happened to the instrument. The final part is the called the phase curve. And this is similar to what uh, Galileo observed for Venus. So this is uh, from Galileo. You see that Venus has its changing phases, right? It starts with just a small crescent, and then when it's on the other side of the sun, it becomes basically full, right? You see the full disk. The same happens with an exoplanet. As it goes around its orbit, when it's in a transit, we look at the night side. When it's just before secondary tips, we look at the day side. And the great thing is, we can do this for planets that don't transit. And what we can use this for is to make a map, for instance, of the brightness of the planet as a function of time and study basically a map of its day to night side. So to call this a map may be an exaggeration because technically I think this is two points, two measurements that effectively make, make this. Right? But you can see that the night side is much darker than the day side. And the interesting thing is, this line here in the middle will be the point on the planet where it's blue, right? Where the star is straight over that. And what you see is that the brightest point is actually offset towards the right, towards the afternoon side of the planet. Actually, if you look on Earth, we have something similar. The hottest point in the day is not when the sun is straight overhead, but it's actually a little bit after. That's because the, energy, the atmosphere retains a bit of the heat, and takes a while for excess heat to be released. So it warms up and it gets warmer slightly after uh, noon. We can expand this, and this was work done by a PhD student at the time in Toronto, uh, Lisa Estevez, and we started to look at the Kepler data. Kepler had been staring at the sky for several years, and what we found was that these brightness peaks were not always in the afternoon. Some planets showed a bright peak in the morning side. And that's interesting. And why is it interesting? Well, we expect that if it's a planet rotating around its axis, that whole spot, that whole point just gets dragged to the afternoon just because the atmosphere takes a while to get rid of that heat. If that's hot, how can it be hotter before the hottest point of the day? What we think is happening is that this planet has clouds that form on the night side, and as they form, they get transported to the day side by the very strong winds, and on the day side, they start to evaporate. But while they're there, they're reflecting light. And if they reflect a lot of light, it can actually make the planet look brighter than... Uh, and so the afternoon is actually a little bit clearer, 
to be experiencing cloudy in the morning with these patterns. Just on time, it's not just limited to uh, gas giants. This is a phase curve of a super Earth that creates a very lava world. You can see the second eclipse here. And you can see, again, it gets brighter and darker. But in this case, because it doesn't have an atmosphere, the brightest point is right when the planet is on the other side of the star. Right? So right at noon on this planet would be the hottest. Uh, I'll skip this. I just want to show you this is work we did with Dave Armstrong, uh, where we looked at the space curve as a function of time. And we saw that if you look carefully, you see that the brightest point is sometimes on the left, and sometimes it's more or less equal, and sometimes it's on the right. And that means that as it moves back and forth to where the brightest point is, it might turn from cloudy to clear and very hot to cloudy and a little bit cooler again. And that could be interesting because that could tell us a lot about the weather on these planets. Um, I think I'm nearly out of time, but I want to end with actually going back to using our high precision spectrographs on Earth to look at that velocity. We did it during the transit. We can also do it during, during the orbit or measure the phase curve. So this is an example for, I think, the planet H209 where we made the simulation to predict what happens. And what you see here, these bright white streaks are light, uh, light that comes from carbon monoxide in this planet's atmosphere, if it's there. Right? So this is an example of what we would expect. And you can see it moves very, it changes quite a lot over time and wavelength, which makes it ideal because the Earth, which is one of our nemesis if you're trying to observe exoplanet atmospheres, because most gases we look through in the exoplanet atmosphere will be in our own atmosphere and will be swapping the signal, but not be moving. So if you can get rid of anything that doesn't move with time, we can actually tease out the signal from the exoplanet. And so we've been working on that for many different planets. We found carbon monoxide, we found some water and things. We found some other things as well. So we find, found, for instance, iris is worked by uh, Miranda Herman from Toronto. And it's very hard to see, and it doesn't come out well on this projector, but there's basically a dark band here, which would be right where the planet should be. This messy stuff going sort of diagonally here, with a lot of wiggles in there, that's actually a star. Uh, being very annoying, but because the planet is moving so fast, it only limits us for a short term amount of time. What's interesting, and it's harder to show in a graph like this, you have to be very careful, is that the planet is actually brighter, in this, or shows more signal from iron after eclipse than before. So we see there's some changes in the amount of iron we see. Which would be nice because that can tell us something about yeah, the conditions in different parts of the planet. And together, Stephens to Grow was a postdoc here, is now in Tokyo. Uh, we've been looking at hydroxyl, so OH, in the atmosphere of this planet. You might just about see the street here. That's where the planet is. I'm showing you the real data. Um, we can just about make out maybe there may be some water. But the interesting thing is that hydroxyl forms from water losing one of the hydrogen atoms in it. So hydroxyl is OH, water H2O, you get some, uh, for instance, UV light hitting this, and it rips off one of the hydrogens, and you left are left with OH. And the interesting thing is that there seems to be a lot more OH than water in this planet, which could be, again, evidence for chemistry, photochemistry. And we're now working on, and if it takes no more data, we might see that the OH is constrained to actually quite a narrow part of the planet. So OH is not nice to distribute all over, at, over its atmosphere, but can only survive for a limited part of its atmosphere. This wants to highlight work from uh, another student where you, actually, where you actually see carbon monoxide. And maybe here it's a little bit easier to see that it appears to be slightly brighter uh, on this side than on this side. It's not quite easy to see. Um, but this again was one of the 
uh, data set where they measure that carbon monoxide is also shown variations across the Pat's atmosphere, which is interesting again because it tells us about the weather. So I want to end here and basically conclude with what's the future? Well, in terms of mapping the chemicals across, JWST will do a great job at identifying many new species, getting good measure to compositions. But if we want to understand the weather on these planets, we will need something like the Extremely Large Telescope. We should get online in a few years because it will give us uh, not only these chemistry of these planets' composition, but also allow us to probe how this varies as a function of location of the planet. So we can study active chemistry on an exoplanet. And with that, I would like to thank you. Thank you.